Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, my name is Gaurav Aroda and I welcome you to the fourth lecture of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. So uh, till now we have uh, you know uh, covered uh, you know we have seen a lot of spatial data and their applications um, uh, in, in different domains uh, which gives us an understanding of how widely applicable these uh, uh, you know these data are uh, as of today. We have looked at the data generating process, which is specifically uh, the remote sensing technology, uh, the satellite sensor technology, and so on and so forth. We also looked at the GIS, which is a, uh, you know, a computer software and hardware system to store, manipulate, analyze, visualize uh, spatial data. Uh, then in the last lecture, we looked at what are called as the spatial data structures. Uh, these are, uh, you know, in particular the raster data structure and the vector data structure and we talked about how, you know, these are different uh, and how their applications differ from problem to problem, right? So today we will move, uh, you know, more formally to the statistics part and, and start departing from the data, uh, you know, uh, 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 part of, of, of this course. So uh, we will, we will, today we'll formally talk about spatial statistics, its scope and purpose. So let's get started. Um, so the first most primary basic component of spatial data modeling are A, spatial locations. So, you know, if you have any kind of spatial data, you need to formally articulate what the locations are, right? So here, what I have is a, is a set of discrete locations S1 to Sn, right? So data in a in a space in a given space or domain are located at locations S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S S6, and so on till Sn, right? Each location will have a coordinate system. For example, if this is a two-dimensional, uh, you know, domain then you know S1 will have a X1 coordinate and Y1 coordinate also known as latitudes and longitudes uh, you know in, 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 uh, in, in remote sensing science, right? And then at these locations, we actually uh, uh, observe spatial data. So these spatial data are then articulated as value Z uh, observed at location S1, value Z observed at location S2, and so on, value Z uh, observed at location Sn. So the uniqueness or the distinctness of spatial data that is observed at different locations is derived from the virtue of the location itself. That's the, you know, basic component of spatial data analysis, right? And data are assumed to be random. So at each location, what we assume is that, you know, you could observe a range of, you know, values of Z. And, you know, these range can be characterized by a probability distribution function, right? This is something we will cover in more detail uh, in, uh, later today or in, a, uh, in the next lecture. But the idea is that Z, S, I is itself a random variable, right? And when we characterize a random variable, we usually will, uh, you know, uh, uh, we will use a probability distribution function, which is to say there is a PDF F linked to location SI, which tells me what is the range of values that uh, this random variable Z can take at location SI. Right? So there will be a probability distribution at SI 
which will determine the values that zsi can take that we mark on the x axis again we will look at these things with much more detail uh, going forward okay and si is one of the locations uh, you know uh, 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 that 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 are there in my two dimensional space that i am uh, concerned about further and very importantly for this particular course we will take locations to be deterministic or fixed so we do not take uh, we do not consider any kind of uncertainty in the location itself so if we observe let's say for example groundwater you know uh, levels at location s1 we say that you know groundwater location groundwater levels by itself is a random variable but the location has no uncertainty right it couldn't be it couldn't be s1 plus minus delta right it is indeed exactly precisely at s1 that we observe z of s1 z by itself at s1 is random so groundwater level is random but the location is fixed right this is an assumption right this is an assumption you can have you, you can have uncertainty in the positioning of data as well but that we deem out of scope for this particular course right so we'll take locations at fixed and we will take data that is the observations the realizations at at each location to be random variables um, so this is something we have talked about at length so one component of you know spatial data is measurement storage retrieval through gis system you know gis is a collection of computer software tools that facilitate georeferencing of spatial data we understand these things now um, it also sort of uh, facilitates integration of spatial entities with qualitative and quantitative information and then all of that can be managed in one environment it mobilizes computational sciences uh, specifically computational geometry uh, spatial languages and user interfaces something that we will look at uh, you know all of these components we will study but this is about you know management storage and so on we are now going to be more concerned about the statistical characterization of these data right so let's let's move to that but when we talk about spatial data this is an important component we have spent quite a bit of time on this and now we are moving to the statistical understanding of these data so in order to characterize in characterizing spatial uh, you know uh, data right so in characterizing spatial data the concept of distance between two locations is fundamental right so we cannot really model spatial data unless we are able to measure distance between two any two given pair of locations where we observe data right so here what we do is we give you a a, a most general form of two locations uh, de denoted as u and v right and these are vectors right so and 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 these are vectors in d dimensional space right so this is these are vectors in d dimensional d dimensional real space right we can always whenever we look at this generalization to d dimensional space we can always learn or 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 figure it out further by by putting d equals 2 that is a two dimensional space something we understand very well right so how do i visualize u and v in a uh, two dimensional space so now my vector u which is bold uh, in the in the typed out text i'm just using a top arrow to denote that it is a vector it will have two components u1 u2 which will be in r2 so u1 u2 are nothing but but x y coordinates or latitudes and longitudes of the data and now location v is given by v1 and v2 again these are just x y coordinates at this second location which will lie on the second uh, you know uh, two dimensional real space right and in this two dimensional real space where you have x and y right uh, we can have vector u given as given by u1 comma u2 from the origin this is my vector u and vector v could be given by this joining the origin to a point which is characterized by uh, the coordinates v1 comma v2 okay uh, given these the question is how do i figure out the distance between 
these two uh, spatial locations, right? Unless we are able to measure the distance, we will not be able to characterize what is the dependence, how dependent are these two, uh, you know, the observations that we see or the random variables uh, that we see at these two locations are. So to be able to characterize that, we need to characterize distance. Uh, the most popular three metrics for doing that is called as the Manhattan distance, the Euclidean distance and the great arc distance, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you must have heard of these earlier. So the Manhattan distance is uh, nothing but a summation of the absolute difference of each coordinate values uh, at these locations. So for our example, uh, the Manhattan distance U minus V Manhattan distance will be given as summation k equals 1 to 2 and absolute difference between uk, uk minus vk, right, which is equal to nothing but absolute difference between u1 and v1 plus the absolute difference between u1, v1, uh, sorry, u2 and v2, okay. Similarly, the Euclidean distance, which is also known as the shortest path, right, that is given as the, which is called as the L2 norm, can be written as following in the two-dimensional space, k equals 1 to 2, uk minus vk, the whole squared, which is nothing but u1 minus v1, the whole squared, plus u2 minus v2, the whole squared, okay. Now let's move forward and visualize what these uh, distances mean. So first of all, I'm giving them these characterization L1 norm and L2 norm, and I want to sort of now formally define what a norm really is. A norm reference refers to the length of vectors between two points in space. So let's go back to our characterization. So we had points U and V in front of your screens and the distance between them is the length of vector between these two points. So the, the, the norm is a formal quantitative measure of the distance between these two points. The Manhattan distance uh, is the distance traveled between point coordinates U and V in a way that it resembles how a taxi cab would drive between city blocks to arrive at its destination starting from point U to point uh, V. So let's go back and visualize this. So on your screens on the left, you have a picture which shows you, uh, you know, a red line, a blue line, and a yellow line, all of which are alternative routes that a taxi cab would take between city blocks to arrive from point U to point V, okay? So that is what Manhattan distance really uh, uh, is able to calculate. The second one, the second type of measure for distance between any two given points in space is called as a Euclidean distance. And this is indeed the shortest path between uh, the points U and V. So again, go back to the picture. The green line is what we call as the Euclidean, Euclidean distance, right? So this is the L2 norm and the green, blue, and yellow lines, as I said earlier, are called L1 norm or they are termed as the Manhattan distance, the Manhattan distance, okay? The third kind is called as the great arc distance, which basically takes into account the fact that the shape of, of, of Earth is a sphere. So if I'm moving from point U to V, I would have to move on a arc rather than a straight line between U and V. So this distinction gives us yet another alternative measure of distance between two points in space, uh, which is called as the great arc distance, okay? So, so these, are, these are primitive, uh, you know, distance metrics. So, you know, they, we, have, we have more sophisticated, uh, you know, distance metrics. I mean, you can imagine in India, the taxi cab uh, characterization between city blocks would not really work, right? So you will have more sort of complicated, sophisticated pathways that a taxi cab would take if they are fol following what, a, let's say, a, a Google Maps uh, route, 
right? So road miles that they cover or road kilometers that they would cover provides us yet another metric of distance between two points U and V in space. Another method is called as the travel cost method. So now travel cost, you know, accounts for not only distances, but also things like time and convenience. So you can have issues like traffic congestion, right? All those concepts can also be sort of, you know, brought into uh, defining distance between two locations. So that these are more sophisticated measures. But the question is, what is the utility of distance metrics, right? So it, the utility really is to be able to model or identify clustering uh, between different pairs of points or locations in space where we are able to observe uh, data. Here, usually regions that are closer together might be clustered together, right? And, 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 you know, uh, uh, and that sort of gives us a point forward in terms of understanding or characterizing uh, spatial dependence uh, in data. Um, let's look at this example of the real estate market of Delhi. So the map that you see is, uh, is a map of average circle rates, which is rupees in meters squared, where you have different districts in the uh, uh, national capital territory of Delhi. Uh, the light yellow colors are referring to uh, low average circle rates in a given district. That is, uh, land is uh, relatively uh, inexpensive in those areas. And the darker circles, uh, darker sort of, you know, uh, uh, blocks or polygons are the ones where the land is priced, uh, you know, uh, uh, at an expensive uh, rate, right? So what you see here is that, let's say if we consider district 1, district 2, and district 3 on this on this on this uh, on this map the distance between district 1 and 2 would be likely sort of uh, to be will be calculated between the center of mass of these districts these respect districts respectively right so the center of mass of district 1 versus center of mass of district 2 will have certain distance length it can be calculated using the manhattan length the the euclidean length or euclidean distance or the great arc distance or even more dis or more sophisticated measures, right? Similarly, two and three also will have a distance calculated between them, you know, uh, between their center, respective center of uh, masses, right? Now, um, what we see here on this picture, when we look at it, it seems like the distance between one and two is quite similar to distance between two and three. However, two and three encounter a natural barrier in terms of the, the river Yamuna, right? So this natural barrier will require us to have a more sophisticated distance metric than a direct calculation of a Euclidean distance between points two and three, right? So this natural barrier, what it can do is, it can cause reversal of trends in terms of the real estate values. Something like that we see if you look at the the map of Delhi, if we go, come from west to east, when we come from west to east, we see that the real estate prices are rising. But as soon as we hit, we hit the natural barrier and we go on the other side, the prices are drastically lower, right? That sort of reversal can come from a natural barrier, which is also a geographic entity, which we want to sort of try and model, uh, you know, uh, through the tools that we learn in this course. So what I'm trying to really say is that distance between two entities is a fundamental metric of how we can study, uh, you know, uh, 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 spatial data, uh, dependence between them, things like clustering and so on and so forth. And how we measure distance can be highly sophisticated, uh, rather should be sophisticated enough so that we can actually model uh, the real world, and, uh, you know, real world uh, observations uh, that we see, an example of which here is that the natural barrier can actually cause a reversal of trends in terms of the real estate values in New Delhi. This is, uh, a, you know, a real world data providing us a, a, a sort of a, uh, you know, a motivation to think about distance very carefully when we work with these data. Okay. So let's come to spatial data modeling. So the earliest attempt one can, uh, you know, uh, that one can think of in terms of spatial models uh, was done by a student in 1907 who modeled the distribution of particles throughout a liquid. He divided one square millimeter 
area of volume, one square millimeter area, sorry, into 400 squares and counted number of particles in each square. So he basically took a, a, a flask of liquid, he took a cross section of one square millimeter, one millimeter squared, he divided it into grids, 400, uh, you know, uh, uh, cells of equal sizes and started counting, you know, a uh, uh, number of particles in each square. So what you have is a count variable. So you have a count of number of particles in, in, in square one, in square two, square three, square four, and so on, and in 400 squares. So when he modeled it, right, when he modeled it, he had to be careful about where is the square that he is counting the number of particles in. Are those squares on the edges of this one square millimeter cube, uh, squ uh, you know, area domain that he's, he's, he's counting his, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, particles in? Or is that, you know, in somewhere in the middle? Does he see higher density of count or higher counts in the middle? Or he sees higher counts in the, on the edges, right? So you can have higher clustering of points in the middle or higher clustering of points on the edges or vice versa, right? So all of a sudden, uh, you know, this exercise that was done in 1907 has a documented, you know, uh, 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 characterization of space, although not as sophisticated in terms of, you know, mathematical and statistical tools as we do today, but, but, but people were trying to already understand, you know, these methods at that time. The other area where special spatial models have been there, uh, you know, uh, for a while now uh, is agricultural field experiments. So agricultural field experiments are done to estimate yields, that is output per unit area on agricultural lands. And there you can imagine that, you know, you can have two farms together growing, let's say wheat. Uh, the kind of output per per unit area that you're going to expect to observe on these farms is, is going to be quite similar, right? Because they are side by side. What would change? They will experience similar, uh, similar rainfall, similar sunlight. They will have similar soils. Uh, the farmers are likely to probably come from, you know, similar backgrounds. I mean, it is possible that the one farmer is richer than the other. Let's assume that they are, they have, uh, you know, similar social, economic, uh, you know, background, cultural influences and so on and so forth. Right? It's quite possible that plots that are located nearer in space will have similar yield values uh, than plots that are located farther away. Right? So researchers have been actively choosing plot dimensions over which they, they, they conduct these experiments strategically in order to account for uh, spatial dependence or spatial correlation in a way that they have distinct understanding when they move from plot one to plot two if these plots are large enough, it's likely that you are going to have a distinct understanding of yield levels when you move from plot one to plot two. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you can have 100, 100 plots highly correlated with each other. You are really not learning much about what's happening on average in a region, right? Uh, then there are methods like nearest neighbor methods that account for spatial dependence. We will talk about those in detail later. I don't want to, uh, you know, you can take a look at this. The only thing that I want to say is that the, the, the value that is observed at location i depends on what's happening at location ni, which, where ni is simply a set of neighbors of i, right? Um, there are other statistical techniques like block bootstrap methods to neutralize spatial correlation in data. These are things that you will learn later, uh, but I just wanted to put it out there uh, for your notes, okay? So let's come to a general spatial model. A general spatial model, first of all, has a space, generic space location in d-dimensional Euclidean space, okay? So when we say this, we have said quite a bit. First of all, we have said that location will be indexed by S, right? S will be, in, will be part of a d-dimensional real space. Whenever we see this generalized d, what we have learned till now, we just set d equals to and we start to develop our concepts from there. So we can have a generic location parameter S, which identifies different points in a two-dimensional space with coordinates X and Y in, a, in R2 space. 
right? And what we are also saying is that we are going to work with a Euclidean space. So now, when we, when we specify or we declare a Euclidean space, what we are also declaring is our method of measuring distance between two points, right? So, so we have said quite a bit in that one sentence, right? Now, suppose the datum, which is the data point, Z on, in location or at location S is a random quantity. Now, we have seen what we mean by a random quantity is that Z of S is going to be distributed by a probability, probability distribution function, which is specific to that location S and allows us to draw different realizations of, of Z, right? Um, and, and S can vary over the index set or domain D in the d-dimensional space. So again, I'll, I'm going to set D equals to, I am simply working with a given specific domain D. So of course, the real, the real uh, two-dimensional real space is infinitum of the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate jointly put together as orthogonal axes, right? So I have x, which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. There is y-axis, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. I define a domain D, which is my area of analysis, all right? So I'm going to define a domain D in this, in this area. Of course, it doesn't have to be a rectangle. It doesn't have to be a square. It can be any regular polygon that you can imagine. So, so I can also sort of draw a more complicated domain D for your understanding. And S is only allowed to vary in this D. Okay, so at a time we are going to work with a given domain in this uh, d-dimensional real space. To understand concepts again, we are setting d equals 2. Then a multivariate spatial model, a multivariate spatial model. So we have used the term multivariate. So we are work, going to work with multiple variables and the variables that we have are the random variables. So multiple random variables are going to be denoted in a spatial model as following. You're going to have Z as a vector, which is in bold, given with the index location S, which is itself also a vector, because it can be a two-dimensional vector, a three-dimensional vector, depending on S being in what type of a d-dimensional space, right? And S must belong to D. So we are going to restrict our analysis or our model of the data, characterization of the data, to, D, to this set D, okay? So what we are saying is that this Z capital, uh, sorry, bold S bold, basically which are vectors, what we are saying is that these are a multivariate vector. So you have multiple variables. So you have Z at location S1, you have Z at location S2, so on Z at location Sn. Okay, and each S itself is a vector, which basically means that this S is X comma Y, X1 comma Y1, S2 is X2 comma Y2, and keep going, and Sn is Xn comma Yn. Such that, such that, such that S, that is S1, S2, keep going S n must lie in the domain of interest, right? So the analyst at least gets the choice to work with the domain that they want to work for, right? So you can't really be working with for an indefinite space to begin with, right? I mean, you need to be able to fix a domain for which you are going to observe data, right? You're, going to, you're not going to be able to observe data in, in a real space, which is unbounded, right? Um, that kind of analysis is untractable, so we do not, uh, you know, do that. We fix D and we move forward from there. And, and so these are all random variables and a realization in space is given by small z, right? From capital to small z and at every location S. So we only get to observe one entity, one realization for the entire random variable. We will formally look at what this really means but a realization in space is given by small z, right? And, you know, we have said that D is going to be, a, we are going to assume that D is fixed. Uh, it could be random, that, but that is out of scope for this particular course, right? Okay, 
So what are the different types of uh, data that would follow that given uh, model? The most popular kind is called as the geostatistical data. Here, D contains of a D contains a D dimensional rectangle of fixed positive volume. So what we are looking at is a rectangle. This would be a rectangle in D equals 2 and in D equals 3, it's going to be a it's going to be a, a three dimensional, you know, uh, 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 cube could be a, 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 a D dimensional or three dimensional, uh, you know, a, a fixed a uh, uh, positive volume uh, domain that we are working with. And when a spatial process that varies continuously is observed only at few points in space, that is what is deemed to be a geostatistical data set. An example that I'm giving here is, is mineral concentrations at, at, at different locations in space. So the idea is that on land, when I'm trying to extract, for example, I'm trying to extract coal or on sea, I'm trying to sort of search for oil. The point is that oil exists almost everywhere in this domain D, right? So oil will exist at all locations in, in D, right? But I can only monitor or observe the, the whether or not I can, I can find oil or not, or how much is the quantity, what's the level or depth where, the, uh, where, where I can extract oil from at only certain search locations, right? You know, practically I can only probe certain locations in D, right? Although I am probing only certain locations, there are possible observations at every location that is possible in D. So you have infinitely many, uh, you know, points in D that you can, you can actually find the quantity or quality of oil that is available, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that is what is called as a geostatistical uh, data set. I've given a wide range of applications that come with geostatistical data set. This is the most popular kind and we will most of this course and in, in most of this course we will be looking at this type of a data set. Um, so again, you know, we have talked about spatial heterogeneity, spatial dependence, you know, large scale spatial trends, uh, small scale spatial correlation, spatial dependence, uh, those types of understandings will start to directly apply uh, to these data. The second kind, uh, 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 so there are, here are some examples of, of, of geostatistical data. One of the most prominent example is groundwater. Uh, here is an example of groundwater uh, 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 quality, that is fluoride contamination. Uh, the idea is that, look, you will have groundwater everywhere. The question is, where can you really, uh, you know, observe it? How, wherever you dig a well, you'll be able to observe what's happening there uh, in terms of quantity and quality. But that doesn't mean that wherever I have not dug, there is no groundwater. The groundwater is available at, at continuum at the entire domain D of interest. Here in this, uh, in this left picture, the, the domain of interest is the entire, uh, you know, uh, 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 contiguous uh, region of, uh, of India, right, as a country. On the left, the region of interest sort of, uh, sort of is, let's say, uh, it's, it's mostly uh, uh, you know, uh, states ranging from Punjab, Delhi, Haryana, uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat. And then there are some states in South. So you have a more restrictive region of interest that you're looking at on the right hand side. So you can have both possibilities with these data. The second type of, uh, you know, uh, spatial data are called as the lattice data. Again, here D is a fixed, regular or irregular collection of countably many points of the d-dimensional real space. So here, I do not have entities moving continuously across throughout the space. I will have fixed, given, regular or irregularly spaced points where I can where I can observe data. A very good example of this is states in India, right? So if I'm observing GDP levels at state, uh, you know, at for different states in India, I can only move through the centers of mass of uh, you know, different states in India, right? I cannot really tell you what's happening within each state if I, if I only have observation at the level of state GDP uh, for India in 2021, right? So there, if you have such administrative boundaries, country boundaries, district boundaries, taluk boundaries, and so on and so forth, some kind of an aggregated unit level data, 
that is known as the lattice data. And a very natural example is in, is in front of you is a is infant mortality rate uh, for for a region in China in 2000. What you see here are irregularly spaced, irregularly shaped, but fixed and given administrative units that are districts in this region where you can observe infant mortality rate, right? Given a, within a given fixed, you know, region of observation, you do not observe different levels of infant mortality. You have one level which is given at its center of mass. So you basically have discrete centers of mass where you can observe data, right? So that is called as, this type of data set is called as the lattice data, right? So this is something we have talked about. Now we have in integrating groundwater management at district level, right? So, so there are many applications such, as such. The real estate data that we saw for the national capital territory of Delhi was a lattice data, right? So we have seen this and we have used this example multiple times throughout this course. The third kind of data uh, is called as the point pattern data. When a spatial process is observed at a set of locations and the locations themselves are of interest, the, you know, uh, are, of, are of interest in the sense are a random variable of interest. So if the location themselves are a random variables of interest, uh, then those spatial processes are modeled as point patterns. The easiest way to visualize a two-dimensional point pattern is a map of locations, which is simply a scatter plot, but with the provision that axes are equally uh, spaced, right? Here, this domain D, the capital D domain, which with, with which we are working, is basically a convex hull of points, which are random variables of interest in space, right? And this convex hull is nothing but the smallest convex set that contains all points in our study, right? So this is this is a lot of technicality. But what I really want to want to want to emphasize here is that if the location itself is a random variable, for example, if I'm studying deforestation, and if I want to sort of if I have a a a a, a wilderness of, of 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 tree canopies, and you have trees being cut at different locations in space, right? So let's say if we have tree canopies at different locations, you know, in space, uh, which is given already. And you want to study deforestation and the random variable of interest is for each point that we observe a tree, uh, you know, a structure, what is the time to deforestation, right? So what is the time at which you will observe deforestation? Then, you know, as soon as, through time, as soon as you observe a given tree being cut down, you can mark it with a circle and that becomes a random variable of interest. So as trees are cut in space, right, you start observing a random pattern of how these point, point patterns are emerging or evolving through time. This is the specific kind of data is called as point pattern data. Let me give you some examples. So, you know, you have, uh, you know, points scattered in space, which you can model as different distributions, right? So first is clustering, right? So you see the first, uh, you know, box there is a highly clustered spatial data set. You have a point pattern where all the points are clustered at one location, right? So points come together in a way that they are clustered in one location. The second is normal. So what it means is the points have come together in space in a way that they resemble normal distribution no matter what axis they are looking at. So if I go by this diagonal in front of your screen, you see a very, uh, you know, you see no data, you see no data uh, at, at both extreme ends of this domain. And as we, as we move forward, you start to have a higher count of points in space. So what this, when we, when we start to count them and plot frequency of counts, what we see is a normal distribution uh, along these two directions, right? So you can go in any direction and you will uh, have this uh, 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 pattern. Similarly, you have a random pattern where you can't really specify a, a distribution and then you have a regular pattern, uh, you know, uh, 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 which is equally spaced points. 
Okay. So uh, there are other, other, you know, uh, 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 other examples, wheat flowering dates by location. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, a supercluster of galaxies, you know, how they arrange over space. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, physical scientists uh, are very interested. They, 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 they use uh, spatial statistical tools to model locations or distribution of, of galaxies. So as a last item in this, in this class, I want to sort of, uh, I want to sort of, uh, you know, want you to identify appropriate spatial data model for the following variables of interest. So in the first, I have a groundwater level depth uh, given by, given at 10 different locations. All, at all these locations, I have a X coordinate and a Y coordinate. So at all given locations, I have a X coordinate and a Y coordinate. I have 10 locations in all. So I will have some kind of a domain. I want to ask you what kind of spatial data model will you be able to put on it? Will it be a uh, geostatistical data set? Will it be a lattice data set? Will it be a point patterns data set? The second example is again by district. Now we have groundwater depth by different districts in, in, uh, in Uttar Pradesh. So these are districts in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, you want to, I want you to tell me or to think about what uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, type of a geostatistical data set are we looking at? The third one, we want to model whether or not we observe a dry well. So what happens is that wells can go dry if groundwater levels go deep enough. And we can only, the model, the, the variable of interest here is whether we have a dry well or we do not have a dry well, right? If we want to model this, what kind of a process are you going to use? So in summary, we have three different types of, uh, you know, uh, 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 data variables to be modeled. We have different types of data structures in an Excel sheet. And I want you to identify which type of spatial data model which will be the most appropriate uh, for each of these. So we'll give you, uh, you know, uh, 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 some time to do that. And then we'll come back and we will resolve uh, this query. Mm -hmm.